So, Phil, you are a sim ant. Yeah. I'm the yellow one, in case you didn't, you couldn't tell. I'm that guy I'm, right I'm there. loving the uh, the screen tearing when you're moving it. Listen, <laughs> man, I'm sorry that computers back in the day couldn't be a billion hertz refresh rate like they are today. Dude, I actually loved computers back in the day. Do 32 you? 32-bit bit extended DOS. You would hook in an ISR, and you could make that puppy run at whatever frame rate you wanted. I'm starving to death. You're like, you know what? I want to set my physics at 30 frames per second. And you would just put an ISR or the clock, 30 hertz, boom. 30 times a second you are calculating physics. I feel like anybody who has fond memories of that era hasn't experienced an old computer for like a while. You got to go back and experience <laughs> it and be like, oh, right. This, this, this nightmare. This is the pain. So I guess my question is, why wouldn't I just make a giant cave? Instead of this tunnel business. Um, because I think you would fall, wouldn't you? Well, no, look, I'm fine. Oh, look, The queen's dropping dudes here were... Uh, yeah, but you're not getting any food. That's true. I'm still starving to death. Oh, I'm berserk with hunger. Your starved and tortured body reaches the limits of endurance. Quick Boy, continue. if I had a nickel... <laughs> For every time, For every time you time. went berserk with hunger and your starved and tortured body reached the limit of your well, You know what they say. You're not yourself when you're hungry. This is, this is the story of game development, isn't it? Oh, I've been reborn. You have been reborn. This is a strangely <laughs> karmic game. It is. I think this is, this is philosophically all about game development. This is actually the afterlife. I've died and my punishment is to become born again and again and again within As an the ant. realm of Sim Ant. With who would then go hunger berserk and uh, reach the limit of exhaustion. Yeah, you just get like sub now. Oh, there's a spider. Oh my goodness. Trent, why are we streaming today? It's Monday. We are streaming today because it is the ninth birthday of Beamdog. Good Lord. Have I, uh, have I missed the birthday of Beamdog or is it, uh, is it ongoing right now? It is going on at that exact moment. So well, we had a cake. Maybe we should stop playing cement and focus so, so a little bit. I'm, oh, wait. I have to save my game because I'm going to come back to this later. <laughs> Surely you just. Eight letter character file names. I love it. Yep. So um, we have a cake. And uh, I took a picture of it. And I will hand my phone to the hand of Dan. And the hand of Dan will show the picture of the cake. It says... What does the cake say? I didn't actually look at it very closely. I just saw oh, Dan, Dan is holding it. it at a 45 degree angle because it's... It won't rotate nice. You can see what your cell provider is. Oh my god. My cell provider is... No, you can't. Happy ninth birthday, you, you filthy animals. You filthy animals. Jesus, what have we got? Macaulay Culkin working for us? <laughs> I think so. This is ridiculous. I think anyway, of nine years. I think Dan is actually Macaulay Culkin. Nine years. Actually, is it? Is no. it only? No, I guess it's 2018. Nobody, nobody's yeah. seen the face of Dan. They've only seen the hand of Dan. They saw, the they saw your face? What, uh, uh, what, what, a, what, a, what a historical marker this is. Nine, nine years. years. Yeah. So the whole master plan was we created this incubator company. This is Cam and I. Literally within moments of me walking out of, out of Bioware, I'm like, Cam, remember how I said it's time we were going to do something amazing? And he's like, yeah, we've talked about it. I was like, today is the day, man. We're doing it. In the Randy Macho Man voice and even with the fingers and everything. Oh, yeah. Oh, brother. yeah. Well, that's more Hulk We're Hogan doing the thing. Else. Yeah, it was. Uh, so Cam's like, all right. So a week later, I'm sitting up at Cam's house, and we're chatting about it, and we're like, what are we going to do? Okay, wait, wait, wait. You went up to Grand Prairie? I went to Grand Prairie. Good Lord. That's yeah, dedication. It is. And then uh, I was like, so we're going to do this thing. We're going to create like a startup company that will be like an incubator. It'll incubate these, these little companies, and then when they grow up, we'll kick them out of the, out of the nest, and we'll, we'll incubate another. So we created this company, Idea Spark Labs. The idea was it would be this incubator, and it would be cool. And then we came up with this idea of, hey, what if Steam didn't suck? Because at the time, Steam was not so good. Like this was this was like early days. Steam was Steam was not so good. And the idea was, what if we had software just work when you fired it up? No installs, no BS. Let's let's figure out how to do this. So we built a system for it, and uh, we came up with what we called Beamdog, the product. So Beamdog was the digital distribution service. However, 
making the games run without an installer. That was me. That was Phil. I had to do all that. Phil, that, that Boy, was... let me tell you, have I gotten familiar with some DLLs that ship with uh, games <laughs> these days. Yeah, Phil, uh, Phil did a lot of the early digging in the trenches it, it, to make stuff work. It was interesting seeing which games would run comfortably in a sandbox versus which ones would freak out and lose their stuff. And it was also interesting learning how to dupe them because yep. some games would be very anal about like, no, I need these files and these registry keys and this stuff set up yep. and I will not run. And it turns out that they're lying sometimes and you can do half of that work and they run quite happily. <laughs> I'm and, sure that uh, works yeah. right up until it doesn't. So on, uh, on birthdays, as I understand, as it has been explained to me, uh, you have gifts, you open these gifts and then you examine what is inside of those gifts. That is, that is, well, that's a very formal way of stating it. Typically Listen, there's some kind of packaging. So what this, we're gonna is what we're not what, packaging? what we're gonna do for the for our ninth anniversary is we're actually gonna show a copy of Siege of Dragon Spirit Collector's Edition and we're gonna open it. But, and, uh, but how will we open this box? <laughs> that's why we have s an Elvish dagger and a kukri, or sorry, a karambit, not a kukri. They're different. Karambit is a it's basically like a little raptor claw that you're just gonna rip people up with. And uh, the Elvish dagger is much more, much more elegant, chopping people to pieces. Do you so. find that you have to rip people's guts out quite often with the raptor claw? Um, Are there a lot of children who mock <laughs> your uh, paleontology <laughs> efforts? I, I haven't yet. Hey, why isn't that kid in the new Jurassic Park movies? Bring him back. Uh-oh. Oh, Dan Lord. has made us a fruity beverage that we can sample before we, uh, before we get down to the... Uh, the opening. Now, if memory serves, this is uh, this is apple juice. 100% juice. Smells <laughs> smells like apple juice. It's too early. <laughs> it's quite early in the day for apple juice, but uh, bottoms up. Yay! Wow! <laughs> apple juice. <laughs> Man, that apple juice sure tastes like assholes. <laughs> Yeah, that is not sunright, my friend. That is not sunright. So earlier, Phil and I were chatting before this stream, and we were talking about... <laughs> that's quite the face, Phil. We were talking about Beamdog and uh, where it came from. You might have noticed I'm not handling the knife. So I have been barred from handling yeah, sharp Yeah, Phil knives. doesn't get to touch sharps. That's, that's kind of an office rule. So Beamdog actually came out of the idea of transfer companion. It was like, we want... We want to build this distro system that can get software to people and make it just work with no hassle and, and no, no bullshit. So it really came down to this, okay, we want to, we want to transfer data and we want, we want your companion, but we don't want a bossy companion. It's not like it's your boss. It's telling you how things are going to be. Oh, you want to use your software? No, you do it our way. It was, we want to be supporting. So it really came down to Beamdog being transfer and dog being your companion. He's like your buddy. He's like, hey man, what do you want to do? You want the software? I got it. I'll get it for you. It's not, it's not working? Oh, I'm sorry, man. I'll go fix it. And uh, that was kind of the whole concept behind Beam Dog. You know, if dogs could talk, I really feel like we would lose patience with them a lot quicker. Probably would. Yeah. Yeah. So beam, transfer, dog, companion. companion. What were some alternative terms that you could have used in oh, those God. cases? BitTorrent wife, <laughs> laser cat. No, laser cat uh, never came up. Laser cat would have been a really, really good one, though. No, I it wouldn't have. Would agree. Laser cat would suck. Laser cat and Ray Ferret, the two alternatives <laughs> that I Ferret. pitched that were immediately shot down. Yeah, there, there was. It was a long, drawn out process. It naming was. companies or naming anything is actually a total and complete pain in the butt. So I've been telling people a story about a spreadsheet. I'm pretty sure it's not true, and it's actually about Dragon Age. What the the naming matrix? Oh, that no. The matrix well, it's partially naming. true. Um, the web name generator. Oh web, right, web two point oh name generator. Name generator. That's where you got all the the source words from. Yes, no, that's where I, I used their combiner. So mm -hmm. the the power of it was that you could put stuff into one category and another, and it would generate the outcome, and then it would actually run a web search to see if that domain was available. So we had like game start, game streams, all sorts of game stuff, and all the game stuff was totally taken. But uh, Beamdog was not. No, I didn't use that. I used the, uh, not the NIM generator. I used their, uh, 
Web 2.0 name generator, this one, Honkat. I don't know if it's that one, but it was, uh, it basically has like. Yeah, this is, uh, this is the same No, this, thing that's not the good one. So the good one is, um, I think it's Dotomator. Click on that instead. Dotomator? Top left. There. Oh, good. So Lord. you put beginning plus ending Agile equals plus result, and it'll automatically name combined. search it. So, uh, Agile Nook. Agile Nook. Agile Patio. So part of using it is if you use the defaults, probably thousands and thousands of people have used the defaults, and all of the good ones are taken, and all the garbage These ones still awful. remain. They're awful. Yes. Brisk flat. Brisk flat. Nothing gets you going like a brisk flat <laughs> early in <laughs> the morning. It's all about the brisk flat, baby. V for, let's see, Venue Cave. Venue Cave. There I can go. only imagine the kinds of hardcore shows that you're going to have there. Yep. Venue Cave. So... Anyway, um, that's that's kind of, that that's was kind of my origin. last process. But uh, Transfer Companion really came out of uh, thesaurus.com, uh, Dotometer, and, uh, and Cam and I yelling at each other a lot. So that was the origin of Beamdog. Then uh, we, uh, we picked up quite a few titles to go into the library. Yeah, we had, at one point, Beamdog was selling close to 400 titles. I think it was more than that. Yeah, we had like 500. We, because Strategy point. First had a huge library of games. Yep. And they were like, we want you to put all of them on there. And, and then, I was like, Trent, there's 600 games here. And you were like, do it. <laughs> no, I was like, That's, I'm glad you've started. Now uh, come back to me when you're done. Um, after... Philip. After a little while, I think we realized that, like, hey, you know, one of the reasons Steam is so successful is that there are some games that you can only get on there. Well, actually, it was it was more involved in that. First, we realized that, hey, people don't buy junk games. And Surprisingly. If, if the game is no good, it will not sell. Who would have thunk it? So then we were like, what we need is an exclusive. We need, like, Steam had had uh, Half-Life Half 2, Life 2 as its kind of big exclusive. We need Hard an exclusive. Hard one to beat, by the way. So... How do we get an exclusive? And we looked around and we we're like, what if we bought an indie darling game and then made it exclusive? And it's like, well, then people would hate us and want us to die in a fire. That would be true. So we were like, okay, that's bad. Hey, wait, we're game developer types. We know how to make games. Types. So then uh, then we actually did uh, MDK2, MDK2, which we Cameron, was the the lead, Cameron was the lead programmer on. And uh, part of the deal on that the only way we could get the rights from Interplay was if we did a Wii version. So we agreed to do a Wii version, and uh, we built a Wii version. And Trent had some questionable words about the Wii that got him in some trouble. I, I said the Wii was a toy. You weren't wrong. I tweeted that. The Wii is a toy. I tweeted it at 3 in the morning because my daughter had just woken me up, and I just skipped around the island in our house to the song um, The Bell of Belfast City for an Hour. And uh, she finally fell back asleep. And then Incredible insights into the personal life of yep. Trent. So I put her to bed, and then I'm tired, and I'm sitting up, and somebody said something about the Wii, and I was like, the Wii is a toy. And people got really mad about that soundbite, but the truth is, I was saying that because of the attach ratio. Yeah, the so attach, the attach, attach ratio trash. is basically, with the console, how many games get sold with it? And the attach ratio on the Wii was like 1.5. So people bought a Wii, they bought Wii Sports, and they were mostly done. Sometimes, they might buy a Mario title. Sometimes they bought Wii Sports Resort. Wii Sports Resort. Sometimes. Or they waited and they got the Wii Sports Resort edition, which had Wii Sports there Resort. And so they didn't need to buy anything. Whereas at that time, the Xbox attach ratio was like eight. So if you bought an Xbox, the chances of you buying a game were really good. If you bought a Wii, the odds of you buying a game was they were horrible. It was really small. The Wii U, uh, similar setup, though I think the Switch, finally Nintendo's really turned it around in terms of attach rate. Um, just because they've embraced indies so, so damn hard. I, I have touched a Switch. I haven't actually played games on it, though. I love my Switch, man. It's rad. I uh, I look forward to using that thing a lot more. Yeah. It's really cool. The Switch is, is an interesting little beast. I haven't played much with it. I want the Dark Souls port to come out on it, but I heard that it's only going to be 30 FPS, and it's like, ah, Ouch. come on, guys. 30 FPS is pain. Anyways, back to the uh, topic of this impromptu stream. So after we did uh, MDK2, we did MD MDK2 HD, which was the desktop release. Yep. So we went through and basically redid the entire kind of shader system for the engine. Cam, working with the, our contractor at the time, rebuilt the, the renderer. Then we worked with a couple of the original artists from MDK2, and uh, we brought them, brought it up to pretty good standards. It actually was a pretty sharp-looking game. I worked in that game. I made the SD card image. Yeah, I, uh, I relit the entire game. 
That's slightly more effort than I put into that thing. <laughs> Internally. And uh, Scott actually made me the tool so I could fly around and just place in the 3D lights. space and I could grab a light and I could move it and I could create a new light. That's how you do lighting properly. That's It yeah. actually worked really well. I loved it. So like after if I, if I ever light a game again, that's how I want to do it. After MK, MDK2 HD, we discovered, hey, you know what? We're getting gangbuster results, uh, kind of remastering, doing enhanced editions of games. Well, and, and actually, this is the time when the iPad had just launched. Yeah, this was... And I, I yeah, poked an iPad, time. and the f so first I heard about the iPad, and I'm like, it's going to be a big iPhone. This is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. An iPhone is brilliant. Why would you just make a bigger one? And Go back to slash dot, buddy. <laughs> and then I, I start thinking about it, and, and this is what I always do with tech. I don't understand it from just the concept. I got to touch it. So I started, I bought an iPad, and I started using it, and I'm like, oh, my God. This is the most amazing computer device I have ever used in my life. It just works. It's not crashing on me. I don't have to double-click things. I'm not doing these bizarro behaviors that have been socially engineered into me. I'm actually just raw interfacing with a computer and doing the things I want. My second thought was, you know what would be awesome on this? Baldur's Gate would be awesome on this. I agree. StarCraft would be very good. Oh, you said Baldur's Gate. I said Sorry. Baldur's Gate. Sorry. That's you, just where my mind was. Yeah. No, I was, I was totally Baldur's Gate. So uh, the next year was securing the rights to the Baldur's Gate franchise. It was, uh, there was quite a few games that we looked at the iPad and we're like, you know what? X, Y, and Z would be great on here. We ran through a list of like well, key we, games. We, we made a want. list of basically 30 games that we thought should be redone. And number one on the list was Baldur's Gate 2. Number two was Baldur's Gate 1. Number four, I think, on the list was Planescape Torment. And number five was Icewind Dale. Yeah. Or those, those might have been switched up, but... Right there, we're like, okay, out of our top 10, four of them use the same tech base. Yep. So, uh, yeah, let's chase that. Also rabbit. on that list, uh, and, and this isn't saying that we're going to do these games. These are just games that we were like, oh, man, it would be great if we could do them. Then we worked through the list, and we spoke to a bunch of publishers, and we realized, oh, only a handful of these are available. Yep. But uh, X-Wing versus TIE Fighter was on there. That's, oh, uh, man. I love X-Wing versus TIE Fighter. That would have been so, so a new uh, X-Wing versus TIE Fighter I would have or loved reimagination. That. Yep. It's been so long since a good Star Wars flight sim has come out. Yep. Um, the Fallout series, obviously, those would have been great on tablets. Yeah, at that time, it was still Interplay Bethesda. It was really kind of a legal mess, it was and pretty messy. we weren't sure where that was going to um, end up. Arcanum. Arcanum I'm, was I'm, actually I'm not gonna, was down quite a ways on the list. Cause but it, it was on the list. It was on the list. It just didn't have a lot of other games based off the same tech. I just pulled a Radiance on Arcanum. Uh, Temple of Elemental Evil as well. We looked into that one. Yeah, um, yeah which is the same code base. Sadly. Uh, I think we looked at the two Crusader games. And uh, we didn't really no, move too no, far on those. No, we, we dug hard into the Ultima series. Oh, man. And I basically, <sighs> I, I got told to piss off <laughs> by multiple people at EA around Richard, there. what do you want from me? <laughs> I want to put Richard, Ultima 7 on an iPad. Richard, Just let me do it. Richard's not involved, man. But he could help. No, he can't. He could it's, help. It's EA, man. If Richard got out there and he was like, I, Richard Garriott, demand that Ultima 7 get ported to the iPad, surely... Uh, a, f a swell of fans would appear to make it happen. No, I mean, Exalt's no. done half the work. No. Um, I'm tortured here, folks. Yeah. It's okay. You'll get over it. Yeah. So ultimately, it came down to EA had plans. They were going to do some kind of Facebook thing. And uh, yeah, we couldn't touch it. So there were a bunch of games that we wanted to do. We fell in with the Infinity Engine stuff because we were familiar with that. Well, we Infinity and, and actually in that original deal, Neverwinter Nights was part of it. Yeah. So actually I, Neverwinter was the first we were thinking about doing Neverwinter first. Yes. Because that was more fresh in our minds and we were like, hey, if you really want to, you know, light up this tablet market. Yeah. Um, it was probably better that we didn't do Neverwinter first. Well, we, we couldn't because uh, we needed Perfect World because Perfect World yeah. had some rights around the Neverwinter names. So yeah, that was right it. when the uh, Neverwinter MMO was launching. So we got into uh, bed with the Infinity Engine and uh, it was just a logical progression of knockout yeah. BG1, BG2, Camas, Ice Camas like, Landscape. So we're going to ninja in and we'll make a couple minor changes and I'll ninja out and no one will know I was there. Like two <sighs> weeks later, I'm talking to Cam. He's like, yeah, I just, I just deleted 300,000 lines of code. I'm like, What? Ninjas don't whack 300,000 words of code. And he's like, dude, it had to be done. And I think in retrospect, looking back, I actually kind of wish that number was closer to 500. Well, when the I, game is the size of windows for work groups, yep. you kind of have to make some calls about like what's going to actually fit on the iPad yeah, here because so we the, can't the, run things like this. The, 
What worked well in the Infinity Engine is the stuff we redid. What continuously hurt us and bit us in the butt was the stuff that we left. Yeah. And I guess, uh, so originally we were looking at doing BGHD. Yes. And that would have been like the ultimate. Actually, I structured the agreement around BGHD and about halfway through, we got the, all the assets from Bioware and there was no art. Yeah. All the art was lost. It had actually been stored in a completely separate directory structure and not backed up. Yeah. So that immediately kind of killed our dreams for doing an HD because either we recreate every single 3D asset in Baldur's Gate, and there were a few. Yeah. These games are fairly large. At the time, like the Baldur's Gate city actually had to be split into those separate pieces mm -hmm. just so that the computers could render them. Because the computers of the day, loading up those 3D scenes, it was like, I'm going to load the scene. And then you would go and get yourself a coffee. You would come back, oh, the scene is loaded. Okay, I'll make my five changes to lighting. And then I will leave that in the, I'll, I'll shut that down, save the file. And before I go home tonight, I will load the file and I will set it to render. And then you would come in the next day and it's like, oh, it's 30% uh, uh, complete rendering. We forgot to add X, Y, and Z. Yeah, and that it's happened too. Now. So it actually wound up, we were rendering for entire weekends at a time. It was, it was just brutal. It was quite brutal. Yeah. Um, so so. We, we were sad to discover that we couldn't do Baldur's Gate HD. Um, so we pivoted to Baldur's Gate Enhanced Edition. Yeah. And obviously and the, that's worked out quite well. Yeah, and us. the Enhanced Edition concept was let's take the game, let's take everything it's got, and let's just make the best possible version of that. Yeah. And two to five years later, after shipping Baldur's Gate, we're still updating it. We're still making patches yeah. to it, still improving it. So uh, I'm going to let you start ripping this open. Okay. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the Enhanced Edition. So when we uh, started doing BG Enhanced Edition, you need your, your Elven Dagger there. I, I've already, I've already do, done the first cutting. So um, We wanted to add more stuff. Uh, and my, the thing that I wanted to add was I love Baldur's Gate for the combat. That's one of the reasons why I think that the whole series was really good. Icewind Dale was built entirely on the combat. Beautiful. Look at this. And so I wanted a way to just get into the combat. Like, let's say uh, I'm on my iPad and I want to play a quick game of Baldur's Gate, but I don't want to pick up my campaign because it's, you know, it's halfway through. There's a lot of stuff going on. I just have 10 minutes to play. And that's kind of where the Black Pits came out of. We wanted to retain all of the depth and the fun of Baldur's Gate. We wanted to have bite-sized chunks of it available on the side. So originally my pitch for the Black Pits was it's just like a straight-up battle challenge. You load yep. a party, you load a, 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 a combat challenge, and off you go. Cam's whole idea was, well, we should give this more of a, a narrative thread to it, a narrative mm -hmm. structure. And that's kind of where the Black Pits came from. Instead of just being a list of combat scenarios that you could take on, it became this sort of living, breathing arena with Bailoth the Entertainer. And I was really happy about it in the end because Bailoth is near and dear to my heart. He's now one of my favorite characters he's, of all he's time. He's ridiculous because, as always, I mean, it starts out with a rough concept, an idea, excessive alliteration being kind of Bailoth's calling card. And then we got Mark Muir involved as the actor who played him, and it, it just took off from there. So Bailoth initially did not alliterate every single sentence that he <laughs> said. It was just like every third or fourth. And he then would sprinkle some alliteration in. Over, over time, you know, you know how, how creative projects go. This the extremes is, just it, get it, pushed. It's how extremism fills our world. It's, it's how Hordes of the Underdark has level 40 nonsense all over it. <laughs> yeah. All right, we're wasting people's time here. Let's rip yeah. this thing open. So... Today, because we're we're doing our ninth birthday, we've actually put the Seizure Dragon Spear Collector's Edition on sale. So I want to show you guys what you got. Sit back so here a little bit. I'll just wave that around in Phil's face a bit. Hey, Phil, do you, you need your nose picked? I'll, well, uh, I'll do that for you. I mean, I don't even think I need a nose. <laughs> you can survive without it. So if you buy a Seizure Dragon Spear Collector's Edition, it comes in this nice box. So one of my big philosophies around, around a collector's edition is it needs three things. It needs something for your bookshelf, something that's awesome that can sit there and that you can be, you can be happy just kind of looking at it on your bookshelf or you can put it on more on display. So we put a lot of effort into making the box and it's got, a, it's got an interesting texture. I, Sadly, the internet doesn't allow us to stream yeah, we'll, the texture, uh, we'll to but it's Danny. actually kind of soft. It, it feels kind of leathery, so it's it's pretty cool. Imagine you're experiencing the softness through Dan's fingers. <laughs> Again, with the softness, there's the main book. Ooh. So the book comes with a coin inside 
actually stuck right in there. And you can pry it out, but I'm not going to yet. Wait, what if you it's, punch the back really hard? <laughs> if you punch the back, it will pop out. But yes. I, I don't want to do that yet. So we went through and, and we, we built a gorgeous book. I'll give it to the hand of Dan. And the hand of Dan can kind of show off the book. There's illustrations in there too. There are illustrations. There are m many, many pages of niceness. There we go. Next week, we're going to do a live reading. Dan's going to sit down <laughs> and read through the entire field report. Yeah. So, and he's going to do voices for the different characters. I'm going to, I'm going to totally knife this out. Oh, here we go. Oh, you're ruining it. It's uh. wrecked. Does anyone want to buy this one? I'll cut <laughs> you a deal. Two bucks off. <laughs> Phil is lying. So it's got the coin on it. The coin has a... The dragon spear emblem on one side and the thrown a ball emblem on the other. Nice. And it's, it's stuck in with a little adhesive there so that when you're done playing with the coin, you can throw it back in there if you want. It's or got a good heft to it, too. If you yeah. still play Pog, this is an excellent slammer. <laughs> um, and if you play Pogs for keeps, well, I mean, that's just intimidating. So th the cool thing about that is that is kind of the thing that I always wanted for your desk. It's like, this is what I've got on display. Yeah, don't so uh, don't try and restick it. Don't restick it, it. It doesn't stick. Um, so my three things is the desk, the sh the the desk, the bookshelf, and on your person, having something on your person. So obviously you're going to wear the map everywhere. You go. <laughs> I'm kidding. The map uh, it just somehow got created. It was like one of these. Oh, we need a map too. So it's it's kind of almost like tea stained. It's uh, it's nice cloth. It's stitched on the edges. It's actually quite robust, and it will stand up quite well. So this is the map around Baldur's Gate, including up to Dragonspear Castle, Dead Man's Pass, basically the whole Seizure Dragonspear kind of storyline. Hey, I wrote the forward to this thing. I forgot about that. You did. Philip Diggle, comma, 2016. Oh, wow. Well. Yeah. That was actually my age. And then... Based on the feedback from the original games, collector's editions, we brought in a spiral bound manual. So you can flip through it. This tells you all about how to play Baldur's Gate. It's got the listing of the spells. It's got listings of what they do, descriptions of, of how things work. Hey, let's get real gross for a second. I can't imagine how much fun I had reading the original Baldur's Gate manual, that thick, thick spiral bound thing mm -hmm. I would sit on the toilet and read that thing for like an hour it's great <laughs> these are images I don't want in my head so <laughs> images I don't want but I learned all about the spells all about the lore of the realm chapter 11 equipment Corin gazed down the length of the paladin sword and whispered softly this is a fine sword you have there friend <laughs> he said it was true. The four-foot long blade was a gleaming you gotta silver. You got to do the voices and better. Inscribed with sigils that glowed soft blue in the dungeon's dim light. Make him sound like Kermit the Frog. <laughs> Despite its length, it was perfectly balanced. It seems strange to write about my own commander, but as this field report may be reviewed by others beyond the Flaming Fist, I'll try to make an objective <laughs> accounting. <laughs> Carol Netterluck has served in the Flaming Fist for over 20 years. He joined as a mercenary when the company first formed in 1345 DR. <laughs> this is uh, Kermit. Your Kermit's kind of bad, dude. Guys, we got a voice anyway, set coming. Anyway, we do. <laughs> yeah, we he'll, be, he'll be the Phil, Phil as, uh, as Kermit the Frog and me as Rando. We dude, tortured Phil voice. in the booth for three hours and <laughs> yeah. we bring the savings to you. Exactly. But the Spar Brown manual is pretty awesome. It's got, it's got some in-game imagery combination of icons descriptions of the spells everything it's pretty hardcore and because it's spiral bound you can open it to the page that you want and refer place it gently the on the uh, desk next to the computer yep. and refer to it and be like oh this is what that spell does that's this what you is sound what that like spell by the way oracle does i never knew what so else we all is in there? we also have a bag a small bag it says seizure dragon spirit i will hand that to the hand of dan it's so petite hand of dan and inside the bag are dice. Actually, has a dice set. So when we built this, the whole Trent three things, and we wound up with way more than three, because apparently somebody can't count. But uh, we got the dice bag. We've got a dice set. And these are all custom dice. They all have special kind of Dragon Spear themed 
uh, printing on them. They got good half too. So if the DM's pissing you off, just <laughs> yep. Um, there's the game on the on the mini DVD box. Fancy. Yeah. Which is pretty sweet. And uh, there's this. This is the this is the Dragon Spear card. So it has the number on it. On the Dragon Spear card, there is a number. So we printed three thousand copies. That's all that were ever made. And we've have sold the vast majority of those. So the ones that remain, there's not that many. This is number 1487. So 1487 will never, never see outside of this office. Hey, that's the current year in fifth edition. Wait, is it? No, it's not. Phil, you're just making it's stuff 14 up. 14 something, I don't know. So it, and it's got a little note. It says, Thanks for, thank you for purchasing Seizure Dragon Spear and supporting our continuing development of the Baldur's Gate series. Cam and Trent. Aww. Limiters Collect Edition 1487. Hey, I heard a rumor that you get a Steam key with this thing. Is that true? You do. What? So that means I get two copies. I get the DVD copy and I get the Steam copy? Yes. I mean, I don't want to hang a hat on that, <clears throat> but... You're hanging a hat on it. So... When I talked about the three things, there was like that one piece of kind of jewelry for yourself. That's it. I'm stabbing this. That knife is so happy to see some use. Yeah. Most of my knives just sit around very unhappy. So we actually have a little necklace, which is the dragon spear, dragon head cast in, in uh, brass. So it's actually pretty cool. We're pretty happy with how this whole thing turned out. It's a, it's a fun little collector's edition. We had a lot of fun making it. And uh, we actually don't have that many left. You should put all this stuff back in the box, and we should give it to somebody. We should give 1487 to somebody? Who wants this collector's edition that we've gotten our skin cells all over? <laughs> Gee, Phil, you make it sound so appealing. That we've breathed on, our <laughs> humidity's in there. <laughs> <laughs> that that I, 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 have, I have stabbed a few times the various parts of it. I had a greasy taco yesterday, and I haven't showered or washed my hands <laughs> since, so enjoy. Don't, okay, I don't like that in the plastic. Yeah, just put put it au naturel in there. Au naturel. Au naturel. All right, the winner of the collector's edition, the one that we already opened, sorry, that makes it a little slightly less valuable, is Natus Inc. Natus, Natus underscore Incorporated. I-N-C. Are you a company? Corporations are people. You're a person, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> our corporations people congratulations you want a free copy of the collector's edition maybe, so maybe if, people are cor corporations there you go if you did not win and you still want to possess this object you can go buy one because it's on sale right now for 60 bucks American yep. you can go to our website and pick it up and uh, it's pretty cool and I think uh, we're, we're actually pretty proud of it. I mean, it was a huge pain for us because we had never done a collector's edition before. So it was yeah, let's talk about the whole process of getting this thing done and um, how it took like way longer than it should have. And, and how there were nightmares and there was yeah. screaming and, and so the, we and fire. made one key dis uh, mistake when we were doing this collector's edition that for a future collector's edition we will not do which was we didn't have the final prototype before we started taking orders. We had a prototype that we were kind of, you know, like, ah, this is pretty good. We're like 80% of the way there. So let's start doing pre-orders now. Yeah. That's wrong. You forgot the map. I forgot the map. That's it's wrong. Like, Don't do that. Three um, things, man. Three. What had happened was like, that what? the original prototype that we wanted to go with, things changed, suppliers changed, and it turns out that that prototype was no longer possible to yeah. do anymore. Yeah, so that's the kind of the difference between a prototype and a production piece is the prototype is let's figure out what it might look like, and the production piece is let's get it actually built. Yeah. And there's a big difference between building one and building 3,000, which we learned. So we uh, made this Dan's problem, poor Dan, the hand of Dan, and made him suffer for months and months on end as we were continually trying to get these prototypes done up, shipped overseas. We had to do multiple rounds of iteration on them. We had to switch providers initially. So it was this whole process and nightmare that would have gone a lot smoother had we locked down the prototype earlier. So if we do any more collector's, collector's editions in the future, and I would very much like to, I'm not going to say. I, I think which. it's something we're we're definitely interested in. We want to make sure they're they're kind of as awesome as as yeah. this one is. But at the same time, this one was a huge pain. I kind of want to do a little less next time, but I want to do I want to do higher, higher, higher. less is more. Yeah, higher quality, fewer, but fewer objects, fewer things, but but definitely definitely more interesting. The that said, I love the feel of this. This is like 
it's it's one of those things when it's you touch soft. it when you touch it it's just kind of neat the one thing i'll say though is i'm really opposed to doing any sort of figurines i know people want like a little statue of irenicus or Cerebach yeah. or something but figurines break so we've like got a more lot than 50 of, we've, we've got of a time. lot of friends who have done collector's editions and we've heard of break rates like exceeding 50 percent where you get your figurine, it shows up, and its arm has been torn off, or its face has been torn off, or whatever sticky outy bit that it had, sword, claw, whatever, is the head destroyed. just popped off or something like yeah. that. The figurines do not ship well. So you could do, like, die-cast metal, but I don't think uh, we've got the budget to do... Uh, no, and that would increase the shipping costs quite a bit. Yeah, I actually, I really like the idea of doing a metal dice set until I saw the quote for, like, $20 for a set of dice. And it's yeah. like, Ermagerd! Just because it's 20 bucks to make the GTO that, guy. That Ironcast Cerevac was going to be like <laughs> most of the cost of shipping, production, most of your profit goes into that. Yeah, it was, And uh, uh, we joked about doing uh, the ultimate Cerevac edition. One, one suit of Cerevac armor with a USB key stuck in under the throne of ball symbol. It would be 20 grand. But and of course, the Founders Edition comes with a sort of chaos, so it's like you'd be a sucker not to get it. <laughs> it steals hit points, guys. Come on. Actually, that's a good suggestion from the audience, Lego minifigures. So I did that. When we shipped Baldur's Gate 2 Enhanced Edition, uh, I did uh, Lego figurines of all of the major companions from the game, and I handed them out to the team. Yep. Um, I actually went through a dude. I don't have his name handy, but he does custom Lego figurines, and they were awesome. Yep, I have um, Dorn. However, to do that like a set and then to ship it with the thing would have been whoa pretty pricey but yeah. man they were so cool. i should dig out those pictures again because they were they were a lot of fun i yeah. have rasad um you got dorn i have dorn yep and everybody else kind of got different figurines um there were some really good ones that viconia was in there yep. we had uh Bailoff, we had Minsk, we had Jir. It was really, really cool. So if you can convince Lego that this is a good idea, <laughs> we've already got like a template Somebody that somebody had done. His Jan Jansen was fantastic because he took the little dwarf legs from the Lord of the Rings Lego sets. I'm gushing here. It's you are good gushing. stuff. Uh, no, it was, it was really cool. And uh, I still have Dorn, but um, he's in a cardboard box that's sitting under my temporary desk. Well, you don't want to lose the pieces. No. But it was it was crazy. Like he would do little stickers for custom armor, and he would stick them on the minifigs. So yeah. here's a here's a question: Is there, are there pre-orders for the ultimate Saravak edition? Wow, uh, no. There's just the one pre-order, and <laughs> yeah. it's pay for it up front. Yeah, you give us you give us twenty grand, we'll make you the silver. We we the know the people Saravak to put edition. you in contact with, though. Like we had yeah. spoken to people about doing the custom suit. So if there's somebody out there with the money that wants the suit, we, we'll put you into contact with the guy. Yeah, I'd actually talked with the armor smith about it. You got to be pretty, pretty in good shape. Let's just say that to make it work. Um, I don't think it's something you want to wear. I think it's something you want to put on a stand and say, "This is my Cerebalk armor. It's pretty awesome." And then when you, if you do want to wear it to some event, you're like, "Ow, it's stabbing me! Ow, ow, ow! It's oh, it's stabbing me and crushing me all at the same time." Hey, this is this is really painful. Well, it's getting to be that time. Having having worn Minsk's armor, I can say that uh, armor. Um, Armor's pretty cool. I, I kind of miss f the feeling of wearing the armor because I used to, I'd go like that and it was solid. I was like a rock. I you felt like I could smash do. through anything. But by the end of the day, I was tired <laughs> because I'm humping 30 plus pounds of leather around. So I can only imagine what humping around 120 pounds of Cerevoc steel would be like. You should change classes to monk because they don't have to wear anything at all. <laughs> They can just go shirtless. It's great. And they get the AC bonus. Blast. It's amazing. Baby. All right, folks. Blast. So uh, today, as we were saying, is the ninth anniversary of Beam Dogs. So we've got a big old sale on the collector's edition. Please go to our website and pick yeah, one up. Yeah, so normally so normally we're selling these, what, they're 129 bucks usually? Somewhere around there. Yeah. So we've got them on today for 60 bucks. USD. American. USD. There 60 bucks USD. Yeah. American um, the world works kind of on the whole USD thing. So. For a while yet. That Euro's coming. We're coming for you, buddy. Yeah. America. We're coming for you. <laughs> we're not using the Euro. We use the we use the loonie. That's true. We have the Canadian. Our, our, our hilarious which currency. Is, which is awesome. Um, somebody's suggesting there that Planescape would make an awesome collector's edition. Hmm. That's true, Trent. Planescape would make an awesome collector's edition. Gee, I wonder who has been saying that a whole bunch of times in the office. Oh, Dan is telling me the same thing on the teleprompter. These guys really want to make a collector's edition for Planescape? Well, gee, Trent, what is it's what is the, the, the 20th anniversary of this year? Uh, I don't know. It's 
It's Baldur's Gate. It's, it's Baldur's 20th Gate. anniversary. Baldur's I know. Gate. I know. I just so that's what that. I'd like to do. I'm just saying. Phil, just Phil wants to do an ultimate collector's edition of Baldur's Gate. That's just me. Because I mean, you know, these people obviously don't want that. So no, I don't think anybody happen. wants that. No, nobody wants this thing. No. So nobody right. would want Baldur's Gate plus Baldur's Gate Two plus Caesar Dragon Spear, throwing a ball, and uh, Tales of Sword Coast all rammed into one box. All right, let's let these people uh, finish their lunches, and uh, we're going to sign off here. That's in a minute. why I'm so hungry. That's why you're so hungry. I should have lunch. So, Siege of Dragon Spear Collector's Edition includes Baldur's Gate Enhanced Edition, and it comes with a Steam key. Go to our website to pick one up. It will come to your house in a few short days, weeks, months. How long does it take to it, ship things? It depends know. on where you're located. There you go. Two weeks. Two weeks is the average. It takes about two weeks. Yep. Yeah. So happy anniversary to us, the happy ninth anniversary of Boondog. Happy Dog. anniversary. Or, or birthday, whichever you choose. Hey, that you know, was whatever. that uh, Flint, Flintstones one. Do you ever see that? I don't think so. Dude, you didn't see the happy anniversary yeah. Flintstones episode? You're you're dating yourself here, man. I don't I don't want to say it, but like, are you going to bust out some Jetsons next? Be like, you didn't see the sweet episode where they busted out the a track? <laughs> Come on, man. Come on. I didn't watch the Jetsons. Did you see the crossover movie where it was like the, the Flintstones meet the Jetsons? And it turns out that they live in the same universe, but the Jetsons are just rich and the and the Flintstones are actually just poor people living in the future. I made that I don't up. believe you. It's a common fan theory and I think Phil it's true. is a liar. It makes a lot of sense because it's like where does the great gazoo come from if not, you know, the Jetsons? Okay, I'm dating myself here. <laughs> All right, so uh, we'll see you guys on Friday. We're going to be uh, doing our regular Friday show. Yep. We'll talk about Neverwinter Nights, Baldur's Gate, Planescape Tournament, Icewind Dale, Siege of Dragon Spear. But until then, uh, please enjoy the ninth anniversary slash oh, just, birthday. Just before we end, the uh, the person who won this uh, requested if we could autograph it. We'll we'll get pens oh, yes. that will show up. And, well, uh, hey, uh, you got like grease spots on it already. We, we, can, we can try and sign it in a way that won't deface it. I'll draw you a little <laughs> picture. How about that? For you, It'll buddy. be a cat, because Phil always draws cats. It's the only thing I know how to draw. You draw two circles, yeah. and then you draw the Batman you cowl. Draw an S, and, and then, then you draw a second the, S. And that's the tail. <laughs> and then the Drunk legs and the feet are just a free-for-all. That's really up to the skill of the individual artist. Low in my case. It's all about Trogdor, baby. It's all about Trogdor. I saw two... I was at the uh, the art walk on White Ave, and two girls were talking about Trogdor, and I'm like, nice. <laughs> I feel Burton, so good. Burning eight in the countryside. All right, okay. folks, we're going to sign off here and go have lunch. Enjoy the rest of your Monday, and we will see you on Friday. Please go buy a Baldur's Gate Cedar Dragon Spear Collector's Edition. Truck door! Burning eight the countryside. Burnin